Mayor Adams announces a new budget that preaches fiscal austerity on the one hand and generosity to city workers on the other. The point is on a field trip to Gracie Mansion, and it starts right now. So I am here at Gracie Mansion with Mayor Adams, and we're going to talk about something that's really important. The legislature has just passed bail reform, or they have a conceptual agreement to do bail reform. And my first question to you is, how will that make a quantitative or qualitative difference in what's going on in the streets in New York City? Well, I haven't had an opportunity uh, to look at the bill or the legislation. The governor announced a tentative uh, agreement and so what we really needed to focus on I'm hoping it is going to be covered covered the extreme recidivists these are the people who uh, come out commit a crime come out and do it again and we have often you have uh, these criminals who say to the officers well I'll be out tomorrow but see here's the thing the judges now will able be able to not impose the least restrictive bail, which means they have discretion right. and they can consider dangerousness, although with the legislature, not dangerousness is like some word you're not supposed to consider. But they'll be able to consider it. So do you think that this will help you in getting some of the more dangerous recidivists off the street? Yes. If we, if the bill as it's passed, <clears throat> and we're gonna, we have to dig into the details, if it is saying that the judges can now uh, use some form of dangerousness standard that is going to be extremely helpful. Now the judge, judges must execute it. You know, there's some judges who uh, really don't subscribe to the belief that people who are repeated offenders and extremely dangerous, they should not be on our streets. So basically you're calling on the judges to take a look at the new legislation and actually act on it. Exactly. Uh, we have a now a new chief judge. Uh, we need to get everyone in the room, do a series of trainings, which is important, and just refresh everyone on what the expectation is to make sure that we're balancing out the public safety and justice. So since we're on the topic of bail and criminal justice, I know that you have a new budget and you're going to have to negotiate with the city council. And you have a city council where the progressive caucus of the city council has a provision that says you can't be in the caucus unless you agree to defund the <laughs> cops. So as a result of that, the 35 people in the city council that were in the progressive caucus was dwindled to 20. But we don't know in the budget negotiations if they're going to try to push you to cut the police budget. How do you feel about that and this push to try to st you know, stop the cops from doing their job? You know, it's interesting when you look at a small number of loud organized group, they basically have hijacked the narrative and the concerns of everyday New Yorkers. New Yorkers want to be safe. New Yorkers support their law enforcement. New Yorkers believe they need to have the right resources to do so. As I mentioned uh, earlier this week, all of us know those three num numbers, 911. And that's just a reality because we know we want our police officers there. But you also earlier this week talked about the fact that in the city council, everybody knows what the overtime is for the NYPD, but they don't know the overtime for any other agency, right, right. and they zero in on that. Right. And they talk about it, and they criticize the NYPD, but they don't criticize any other agency for working overtime. Is that a frustration for you? And how are you going to deal with this group of people in the city council who are going to try to push you in budget negotiations to cut the NYPD budget? Well, uh, first, the, I'm not frustrated because I know what the public wants. And if you were to stay inside the chamber, echo chamber of just politics, you would believe that those who are pushing uh, not to support police and always want to be antagonistic to our police, you'll, be, you'll believe that's the public opinion. And it's not. When I'm on the subways, when I'm at uh, my parks, walking the streets, I know what the public of the public is actually, they're actually saying. Now, when you look at the overtime, we're down a thousand police officers. Whenever you're down in HRA, H ACS, et cetera, you need overtime to actually 
complete the task. Exactly. And so if I say to people when they talk to me, the city council members or whomever is talking to me about, well, we need to cut the police budget, I say, okay, we have to take them off for certain patrol assignments. Is it your block I'm taking them off of? <laughs> is, it, is it your train I'm taking them off of? People don't really understand what they're saying when you state to not be there for police. So as you dig in to deal with the city council on the budget, which you have to do by the end of June, is, are you drawing the line at uh, reducing the budget of the NYPD? Is it going to be just a non-starter for you? No, every agency did what we call a PEG program to eliminate the gap. And but the city council wants more. They're not getting any more. Uh, Commissioner Sewell did an amazing job. She looked at some of the spending we were doing, things that we could wait to spend on. She was able to reach the peg that we had all agencies do at the same time in no way jeopardizing the safety of New Yorkers. I'm not going to do that. I'm not, never going to put the safety of New Yorkers over the rhetoric of others. But sometimes I wonder how these people get elected given the fact that they don't seem to be reflecting the opinions of the people in their communities that you talk to and and actually I talk to as well I mean if you go when you go into the communities your voters are saying we want public safety we want more cops we like what the mayor's doing right so how what's the disconnect well the number one issue when you look at all the polls over and over again you hear that people rank public safety as one of the top issues the problem is is that many people have become disenchanted with politics and they don't come out to vote. When I'm out now, we're going to be doing a large number of town halls like we did before. I'm going to explain to people the connection between that person who's carrying that gun, repeatedly coming out, and the person you're voting for in your district. They need to understand the power of their ballot that is going to determine, determine the quality of life in their community. It sounds like you're going to be campaigning against some people who are going to be running for office who are currently elected officials. Well, I'm, I'm going to be campaigning against those ideas that are not, I believe, at the cornerstone of what New Yorkers need. That translates to people who are running for office who currently hold them. If they fit that shoe, they need to wear it. <laughs> you know, when I was at City Hall the other day, you sounded very frustrated about the people who are anti-police and I wonder if you're frustrated about that but also if sometimes you feel that it, the things that you're doing aren't getting through and that's a frustrating thing for you because you think that you're doing good things but you're not getting the credit for it. Well you know I, I know we're doing good things. We are, we are uh, moving forward on some, um, some great ideas and I know how successful they are. And we all know that often appreciation is, appreciation is retrospective. My goal is when I walk through the museum of the city of New York, people are going to see, we know what this guy did while he was the mayor of the city of New York. So I want to ask sort of a weird question, but <laughs> it's a little, so the MTA has decided not to use Twitter anymore, saying is it's, it's not a, a good or responsible uh, social media post. Is the city considering the same thing, not going on Twitter because it's been a little bit weird and, and unstable the last uh, month or so? Well, I always told people that it's not about people on social media, it's about people on social security. And that is my way of saying everyday New Yorkers are not sitting around home somewhere uh, tweeting out their criticism and the negative energy of those who are on some of these platforms where they are constantly spewing out negative en energy over and over again. And so we're going to use every platform. So to you're be still going to use Twitter? Yes, we're going to be co communicative. You know, um, there's some tabloids <laughs> that they just enjoy uh, spewing out negative energy. I can't say I'm not going to use those tabloids. I'm not going to hold a presser. And so it is the use and not the abuse, and too many people are about abusing and not properly using Twitter and other social media platforms. Okay, we're going to leave it right there for now, but we will be right back. We're back with the mayor of the city of New York, Eric Adams. So one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is the labor contracts, which are going to cost the city $16 billion, but you passionately defend 
raising the, the money that people in wor who work for New York City are going to be getting. I wonder if you could tell me why, and does that have something to do with the fact that your mom was a worker at DC 37 and you think it's important to pay people a living wage? Well, th prior to the contracts being settled, uh, I went out and I communicated with my agencies, and I communicated with workers. You know, that conversation is important. This is what I walked away with, three things. Number one, we're not competitive. We're losing employees, and we have a large number of vac vacancies because we're just not competitive in salary, uh, flexibility, and the new environment uh, post-COVID. So we have to adjust that. Number two, the stories like you stated. My mom was underpaid. She was raising uh, six children. We had to eat the leftovers from the daycare center that she worked at as a food service worker. And I was a civil servant. We have to make sure those who are running the city can run their households at the same time. And it's just has been unfair. But you see, there are critics who are going to say that by raising the rate, that people are getting paid. You're raising the pension costs and the out your pension costs when people retire. Is that something that you worry about and can the city afford to do that since pension costs are like a huge problem for any mayor, whether it's you or your successor? And those critics make several hundred thousand dollars a year. They have great pensions. They may have you know, two or three homes. They are enjoying life, but they're looking back at those who allow this city to run you know, many of those critics remotely worked <laughs> while the Uber Eats driver, the food service workers, the transit workers, uh, all of them, the police officers, they were here. And we have to make sure our working class is able to live in a city that has become unaffordable. So you say that given the fact that even if pension costs do go up, it's a good expense for the city because you're showing respect? No, what we're doing is more than that. We are investing. Those employees, for the most part, live in New York. They're going to go to the restaurants. They're going to shop. They're going to be a part of the economic stability of, this, of New York. When you look at the men and women who are part of DC 37, most of those titles are required to live in New York City. We are investing people who live in New York City to recycle our dollars. So you just said that you yourself was a city worker. You were. You were a police captain. Mm -hmm. And you got a salary that was not that big at that time for um, a transit police officer. Did you yourself have trouble making ends meet because you were on, you believed in the job, but you also got a salary that, you know, I mean, if you had worked at, in Suffolk County or Westchester County, you would have been paid a lot more. Right, think about that. Uh, when you looked at the money that those in the neighboring counties outside the five borough, the police officers were making extremely more and the cost of living was less. And so we're now competing in trying to recruit police officers and they're looking at their counterparts and they're saying, why do I have to stay in a city where crime is higher, where oftentimes the loud, boisterous people are attacking them? So we need to be competitive when it comes down to recruiting our law enforcement and other civil service, more than see, law I enforcement. See, I just wondered, given the fact that you yourself experienced the low wages, that, that gives you a greater sympathy for the people who are now having to go through it? Well, the combination of going through it, uh, I went through it, my brother went through it as a sergeant, my, uh, several of my cousins came in on, on at the same time. We saw the struggles. Uh, I, I was a real estate agent during the time I was a, a lieutenant in the police department to help pay my son college tuition. So you can't go out and worry about how you're going to provide for your family. So you family. had to have two jobs just to pay your son's tuition? Yes. Two so jobs. you want to make it easier for people so you understand? Exactly. I understand completely what police officers are going through and other civil servants. You know, when you have a person who's an HRA employee also needing to fill out forms for food stamps, that's the problem. <laughs> that we, that's not how you run a city if you're not taking care of your workforce. So one of the problems that you're going to face, what you're facing, is the fact that so many people didn't want to come back to work full time that we have a lot of empty office space all over the city. And big apartment buildings, or big office buildings that you might want to turn into apartment buildings. But I wonder if you're thinking about the possibility of a vertical city 
that you could take one of these buildings and there might be a school there. There might be, you know, a restaurant on the 52nd floor or a beauty salon or something like that. Is that something that you would consider trying to reimagine how we use all these office buildings that could be put to better use? Well, you, you, the word you used was, was probably the most important term. We have to reimagine. The pre-COVID New York is not the post-COVID New York. We have to look at these spaces as uh, child care centers on the bottom floor to encourage people to come back into the office. Uh, we have to change the seating arrangements. Uh, we have to make it an experience. I've visited several offices. And then we need to turn it into housing. Ten million, million square uh, feet of real estate, office real estate. We have to do something with it. That's why the housing plan in Albany is crucial to get through to, so that we can deal with the housing needs. Yeah, but they put that off. Yeah, but the session is still on. So we're hoping that they will take this up during the session and pass the legislation that's needed that the governor put forward and help us with our moonshot desire doing 500,000 units, new units of housing. Do you think, what kinds of changes do you think are going to be necessary in order for you to reimagine all these office buildings? Because right now, you know, they're there, they're empty, and they could be doing good things. Combination zoning. Uh, requirement raising what's called the FAR, allowing us to change and make it easier to do the conversion uh, into housing. And we get affordable units, we do incentive, we need the 421A. So there are things uh, that are happening right now in Albany. Many of these terminologies is probably foreign to everyday New Yorkers, but it's a real impact to the ability for New Yorkers to live. But the problem has also been that there's also tenant activists on the other side that want to exact, exact concessions for tenants. They want good cause eviction. They want a number of things that would make it easier for tenants to stay in their apartments. How do you feel about that? And we should find a balance. Uh, you know, like I have uh, uh, two tenants and they signed the lease. I, I told them I'm not going to raise your rent as long as your tenants because it pays my mortgage. Uh, finding a proper balance is what's needed. The balance for the tenants so we can stabilize the hemorrhaging of tenants that we're seeing and at the same time understand that there's a level of money that's needed to run good clean uh, housing which is important so you call yourself a tech geek <laughs> and you have trotted out digi dog which really helped when you had the the garage collapse and you have two robots that are going to be patrolling times square and subway platforms my question to you, where else is the tech key governor going to go, um, tech key mayor going to go with bringing technology to New York City so we're more efficient? I, I can commit to you, uh, by the time I finish with mayor, you're going to see an entirely a different city on how we deliver goods and services. Uh, we're going to look at the universe of bots, BOT. It is a way of really using technologies to allow humans to do more things instead of being restricted. There's no real reason we have call centers with human beings picking up the phone, answering every call. There's other ways we can do that. So you could have bots answering those calls? And answering the calls. Could they and do 911 calls or just regular calls? We're looking at everything that a bot can do in different ways of doing those repetitive human interactions, but also drones. Uh, we, it's unbelievable. We had, that, we had this uh, part of a building come down yesterday in NYCHA. There are drones that you can actually scan the building, use infrared. Safer. Exactly. You know how we check the building now? Someone goes down the building on a rope and check. You're kidding. Yes. That's the city we live in. This is New York. You know, others are using drones and we're using ropes. <laughs> That's unacceptable. Not to mention the fact that the ropes are dangerous. So they could, you could fall. Well, they're, they're well trained, but it's just a, we have to shift our mindset that this is, we were leaders of technology, not followers. And now we're going to lead again. So we're going to have to leave that right here for now, but our conversation continues on our streaming section, CBS News, New York.